Добрый день, уважаемые студенты. Я очень рад сегодня приветствовать нас в гостях, выпускникам ГИМО, исполнительного секретаря подготовительной комиссии организации по договору о всемобильничьем запрещении ядерных испытаний Тибора Тота. Тибор Тот наш выпускник. Закончил... Закончил факультет международных отношений в 1977 году. Я вспоминаю то время, я примерно учился в то же время, у нас было очень много венгерских студентов, и в моей группе были, в языковой группе 6 человек, было двое венгров, одна из них была девушка очень симпатичная, по им, с приятным именем Сусанна, которую все называли Жужа. И вообще было много венгров, вот на факультете даже МЖ, не только на МО. И все это были очень приятные люди, мы долго э, поддерживали связи, поддерживаем связи после окончания нашего университета. Сейчас, конечно, немножко поменьше э, венгров у нас учатся, но тем не менее, все те, кто закончили ГИМО, они наши друзья и приходят там при первой возможности. А визит э, у Тибора Тота сюда в Москву очень важный, он встречался с э, министром иностранных дел Лавровым, были встречи в Росатоме, в Министерстве обороны были встречи с научной нашей общественностью, так что это насыщенный и очень важный визит нашего выпускника, друга и представителя очень важной международной организации. В свое время вопросы ядерной безопасности стояли очень остро. Мы все как студенты их изучали, я уверен, что Тибур тоже весьма активно изучал вопросы ядерной безопасности, когда учился на него, поверьте, что этот вопрос был вопросом номер один, поскольку было противостояние двух держав, СССР и США, и все, что было связано с ядерной безопасностью, ядерным разоружением, стояло в повестке дня и было первоочередной задачей внешней политики. Поэтому мы знали досконально, какие были договоры, какие договоры действуют, кто участники, кто не участники. Сейчас ядерное разоружение несколько ушло на второй план, хотя это продолжает оставаться самой важной проблемой человечества, поскольку угроза полного уничтожения, она никуда не уходит. И Тибор возглавляет подготовительную комиссию организации по договору о всеобъемлющем запрещении ядерных испытаний. Это важнейший договор, поскольку в рамках этого договора и в рамках этой организации должно быть достигнут консенсус о конечном запрещении ядерных испытаний. Есть договоры о запрещении ядерных испытаний в различных средах, но всеобъемлющего договора, того, который не позволит дальше производить ядерное оружие, пока еще нет, и некоторые страны к этому относятся скептически. Я не буду долго отнимать ваше внимание, хотел бы сразу передать слово нашему гостю, но только несколько слов о его биографии, чтобы вы понимали уровень человека, который сегодня к нам пришел в гости. И, как я уже говорил, Тибур тот закончил МО в 1977 году, в 1987-1982 работал в центральном аппарате МИДа, Затем работал в постоянном представительстве Венгрии при международных организациях в Женеве. В 1986-90-х годах был заместителем директора департамента международных организаций МИД Венгрии. В 1993-м постоянный представитель Венгрии при международных организациях и на конференциях по разоружению в Женеве. Заместитель министра обороны в 1994-1996 годах. Посол по особым поручениям в 1996-1997 год курировал вопросы нераспространения ядерного оружия. В 1997-2001 постоянный представитель Венгрии при международных организациях в Вене. В 2001-2003 посол по особым поручениям, также курирующий вопросы нераспространения ядерных технологий. В 2003-2005 постоянный представитель Венгрии при международных организациях и на конференции по разоружению в Женеве. И в 2004 году назначен исполнительным старем постоянной комиссии организации по договору о всеобъемлющем запрещении ядерных испытаний. Так что перед вами венгерский крупный дипломат, политик и крупный международный чиновник, международный дипломат. И нам очень приятно приветствовать его сегодня здесь, поскольку ему гордится своими преподавателями, студентами и выпускниками, особенно выпускниками, которые добиваются таких выдающихся успехов. Я предоставляю слово
Спасибо за теплые слова. Да, действительно, в 1977 году хорошие новости, что не 80, 1877, а 1977 был год, когда я закончил институт. До встречи я признался, что я не могу найти своего диплома. Я попросил, чтобы выпустили копию. И мы обсуждали этот вопрос, надо, бы, надо ли избавиться от диплома в первый же день после окончания, или надо подождать немного. Но есть обещание, что я получу копию своего диплома. Поскольку я 35 лет не говорил, не использовался русским языком, если позвольте, я хотел бы переключиться на, на английский. Если будут вопросы, конечно, я готов ответить на русском языке тоже. Но из-за тематики мне, наверное, будет легче по-английски объяснить, что мы делаем, чем мы занимаемся. Но перед тем, как перейти, я должен сказать, что у нас никогда такого полного зала не было. Я не знаю, в чем секрет. Как вас заставили, как вас заставили, что вам пообещали. I... I do not want to be the least popular lecturer, so I will try to keep my, my lecture uh, within a human time frame. But let me try to make a few points about the treaty I am working for. I am the head of the organization uh, dealing with the prohibition of nuclear weapon tests. And I would like to say a few words how this treaty works, how the organization work, works, and why you, future diplomats, future experts in different areas, should pay a bit of attention to these issues. And I will explain a, a training course, a distance education training course, and at least virtually, I would like to see many of you joining that training course. The first point I would like to make is this graph. If you ask me, please explain to us in, with one slide what the hell you are doing. I will show this slide. I will show this slide to you. This is a slide depicting nuclear weapon test in between 1945 and between 2009. And uh, this slide is not just reflecting the number of tests, but this is history. You can see ups and downs of nuclear tests, sometimes reaching a level like in 1962, more than 150 level. But you can read history because if you pay attention, the peak happened when in 1961, in 1962, the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile crisis happened. And there is a decline, there is a valet, a downturn, when the relationship between U the United States and the former Soviet Union was better, like middle of the 1970s. And then again, it was picking up in the late 1970s, this graph, when the situation, the political climate was deteriorating. What the treaty did and what the organization did is reflected on the right-hand side of this graph. So instead of four or 500 nuclear weapon tests each decade, each 10 years, during the last 10 years, we had only two of them. There is an English phrase, and there is no Russian equivalent, two too many, two more than needed. Two too many. DPRK, North Korea carried out those tests, but as you can see, the, I call it the genie of nuclear tests was pushed back in the bottle. Why I call it genie? Because it was a pollutant. Pollutant not just speaking in terms of the, of the environment, in uh, the period in between 1958 and 1961, there is a break. 
on this graph. There was a moratorium of nuclear testing at that time between the United States and the, and the former Soviet Union. Unfortunately, that moratorium was broken. And what happened is described as a testing frenzy, where in 16 months after August 1961, in 16 months, more nuclear weapon tests took place than in, in all the years before that. All the 16 years before that were less tests than in 16 months. And of course, it was, it was a period when uh, the, the biggest uh, and more devastating nuclear weapon was tested, a 50 megaton Tsar bomb. It was a Tsar bomb called Super Bomba. You might have heard about that, which is 4,000 times more destructive than, than Hiroshima, 4,000 times. But it was an atmospheric test, and you understand with, with nowadays approach to, 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 to the release of radionuclides, what kind of uh, pollution it represented. But what is more important, the political pollution of the, of the political atmospherics. Why? Because the two countries were sending messages to each other. And these were not very friendly messages. To each other, to the level where around 180 tests took place in those 16 months. And not by chance that as a result of political complications further spiced with these messages, Berlin happened, the Berlin crisis. Those who are, who are following uh, German history or specializing in Germany might remember that. Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, in October 1962, by now, it's absolutely clear that this was the closest encounter mankind has ever had and hopefully will ever have with fate. Recently, Jacqueline Kennedy, the former wife of the former president, John F. Kennedy, her audio taped memories were published. It's brand new. It came out a couple of weeks ago in which, in 1964, it is videotaped that, yes, in October 1962, she was insisting to President Kennedy that she would like to die next to him together with the family. So this was the situation at the highest level, at the, at the level of the presidential couple, and it was going down to each and every family, practically, because people understood the complexity of the situation. So this is what I call a pollutant, a political pollutant which did not help to untangle complicated political questions. Of course, we shouldn't be as naive as blaming everything on the test, but it was further spiraling the, the relationship to, to, to unacceptable levels of tension. So that's why on the right-hand side, the, the two tests which happened in the last 10 years, are hopefully leading us in the right direction. Leading us in the right direction in a situation where we don't know what is beyond the vertical line. 2011, there is a vertical line. You don't have a crystal ball, no one has a crystal ball. What will happen beyond that line? What, what future keeps for, for you and for us and for everyone. But if the next years will be more complicated because of the economic and financial turmoil each and every country right now is facing, coupled with more social tension, coupled with, with unemployment issues, among others, un unemployment issues for the, for the young generation, generation problem, we don't need an additional dimension of complication called nuclear, uh, nuclear, co nuclear uh, competition, nuclear arms race, new dimensions of a nuclear arms race, hypothetically spinning out of control. So the treaty which was concluded in 1996, prohibiting nuclear weapon tests, together with a system which is listening, hopefully, to the silence of the test sites, achieved that. 
this is where we are, and this is where we would like to keep the level of nuclear weapon test for the reasons I mentioned to you. There is a growing number of countries which uh, there is a growing number of countries which uh, signed and ratified this treaty. Uh, among them, uh, Russian Federation. Uh, yesterday, I had a, a very interesting meeting with Minister Lavrov. I thanked through him the Russian Federation for for the ratification, for the political support given to this treaty. Besides the Russian Federation, from the so-called P5, nuclear weapon states. There are two more countries, United Kingdom and France, which ratified as well the treaty. United States and China is still to ratify. I'm trying to put the emphasis on still to ratify. So we will, we will have to continue an engagement, both with, with the US and with China, to, to have these ratifications falling in place. In addition to these countries, in the last 15 years, because a week ago we had the 50, 15th anniversary of the treaty, there are 155 countries who ratified the treaty, and 182 members. So this is an expectation of 155 countries to stay on that road, to stay on the road of adding more transparent and more cooperative relationship to just the military means of trying to achieve security. You might ask the question, what is the right mix or, or why is it important? Because um, all these things like uh, disarmament, non-proliferation, arms control my, might sound a bit fluffy, not, uh, not very tangible. Besides the previous chart where I tried to show to you the, the, the impact of a treaty, impact of a, of a regime prohibiting nuclear weapon tests, let me try to explain from another angle, compare it to trade protectionism, if countries are trying to maximize their trade interest and just taking care of their own trade interest, then it will eventually will lead to less trade for each and every one and, and for all of them. So there is a need to optimize the interest. There is a need to, to make cooperative, positive trade-offs. It's exactly the same for security and 155 countries together with the Russian Federation do believe in that. The complexity is the regions which are missing from the green. You can see that uh, there are countries with gray who did not sign the treaty. More significant ones are India, Pakistan, and North Korea. And there are countries with Turquoise who, who signed the treaty but did not ratify. What is the message of this map? The message of this map is that there is a bit of a hole in certain regions. Of course, I would like to see the America's region removed, that is US ratification. It's, it's absolutely important and it's, it would be a, a game changer for, for all treaty to, to move forward. But in addition to that, in Asia, there is, a, there is a hole. There is an absence of countries from Asia from this arrangement. The same goes for the Middle East, wider Middle East. Why I am personally concerned about that? These countries should care about their own security. So they should think through whether they belong to an arrangement like that or not for themselves, not because they, they should do a favor to the other 155 countries to be nice to ratify that the treaty could enter into force. Their security is, is at stake. Take the South Asia subcontinent, India and Pakistan. There is a very complex competitive relationship. 
and compared to the 1950s or, or the 1960s, this relationship is even more complicated because of the terrorist element. Mumbai and, and each and every year uh, there is uh, one dozen terrorist acts uh, happening, both on the territory of India and on the territory of Pakistan. In a situation like that, having an increasing amount, not just of weapons, but uh, fissile material, more and more facilities which are producing more and more fissile material and more and more people who are doing this type of job, is increasing statistically the likelihood that the next or the next after terrorist attack might uh, raise the problems to, to a high level, dirty bomb or this type of scenario. So these countries will have to reassess, do they want to have an open-ended arms race in the region or do they want to add more cooperative relationship, more calculable relationship where the stockpiles are not increasing the other way around, stockpiles are coming down. And there is a good example recently shown by the United States and the Russian Federation the, in, in the area of strategic weapons, when, when in addition to cap, there is a downward uh, trend. Middle East, very similar. So it's, it's Asia and Middle East, very similar. Um, the diplomatic arms control safety net is missing from below the countries. And both Asia and the Middle East are the areas where, yes, uh, there are nuclear arsenals, there is a potential for a competition, further arms race, in addition to that, nuclear energy is creating additional challenges. Nuclear energy, if it is misused, can be a, a part, a legitimate part of a mix, of an energy mix. If nuclear energy is misused, if nuclear energy is used like North Korea did it, or I don't know where exactly Iran will, will move, then instead of a blessing, it could be a headache. It could be a sub-regional headache, a regional headache, and a global headache as well. And Asia is one of the regions where the increase of nuclear energy and installations will be very dynamically increasing in the decades ahead of us, and Mid Middle East would be another region as well. So there is a, there is a bit of uh, work cut out. So if you, if you have a look at this map, you can identify for yourself in case you will be dealing with these issues where you we should focus our attention for the future, where together with those countries, we can create those safety nets below relationships, political, economic, energy, and, and uh, cooperation. Let me, uh, for a moment, go back, if the slide will be allow me, to this slide. Uh, you see many dots on that. Uh, let me explain what it is about. There is a treaty saying no more tests. By no one, nowhere, never. It cannot be just a promise. So what we are trying to do is to, to listen with what we call international monitoring system to the hopeful silence of those tests. It's like an anti-burglar system, okay? So if anything is trying uh, to do something unlawful, a nuclear test breaking, that system will ring. And that system is registering those noises through listening to the underground, with so-called seismic stations, listening to the depths of the oceans with hydroacoustic stations, listening to the atmosphere with what we call infrasound stations, and sniffing the air for the release of radioactive substances coming from, from nuclear weapon tests. All that is done on a global level. Nearly 400 stations, we, we couldn't drop all the double dots, because there are double and triple dots, 400 dots, 
The international community invested in this undertaking $1 billion. It's a huge system. Russian Federation completed 70% of its monitoring, what we call segment. What does it mean? Russian Federation, together with other nuclear weapon states, are not just telling others what to do in terms of nuclear disarm and nuclear non-proliferation, but showing an example of leadership where opening up to outside monitoring by allowing verification monitoring stations on the territory of the, of the Russian Federation. United States doing the same, France doing the same, UK doing the same, hopefully China soon uh, doing the same. Why is it important? Because number one, Transparency in this area will hopefully lead to less misunderstanding and mutual suspicion what might be going on, whether there are uh, unlawful activities, whether there might be potentially a breach of the, of the treaty. In addition to that, why this system is important? This system is important to give you an example, uh, North Korea, 2006. North Korea detonated the nuclear weapon. All the members of the Security Council, not just the P5 permanent members, but everyone received an information the same day as a result of this system. So there was no mistrust by the non-permanent members of the Security Council sitting in New York the same day and discussing what kind of action should be undertaken. Action is important because if there is no follow up by the Security Council, these tests will continue. And with each and every new test, there is an improvement of a, of a design of, of the nuclear weapons, which later on might be available for, for wider use. It's a question probably of, of the amount of money and uh, the question of, of, uh, of uh, countries who might be eager to, to do that. That's the significance politically of the system. The additional element is Fukushima. And uh, let me try to uh, jump a bit forward and to show you some slides which might be interesting. First of all, this slide. If you have a lot of money, this might be a slide where not to invest in property, okay? These are the fault lines, tectonic uh, hot uh, spots on the earth. We are listening to seismicity, and we are trying to see whether behind earthquakes or tsunamis, there might be man-made noises of nuclear weapon tests. In the 10 years period, there were only two, fortunately only two nuclear weapon tests. At the same time, as you can see, there were more than 300,000 different types of earthquakes and different types of accidents as well. Eventually, it might be background noise with the, with the exception of the two tests. We don't treat that data like that. We are using it, especially for tsunami warning, for alerting countries which can be affected by tsunamis about, about the, the alert activities they have to undertake to move people out of, their, out of, out of the coastal areas. How we do it? Uh, we have a high number of seismic uh, stations and in a very short period of time, this uh, information about uh, huge earthquakes is arriving in seismic regional alert centers. And they can issue, as a result of our system, the alert three minutes earlier than otherwise. Why? Because we have a dedicated communication system, which is three minutes more speedy than the other communication systems. In three minutes, people can run a lot of distance. Three minutes might save a lot of lives. So the, the system is not just relevant to prevent political pollution, but it's relevant as well for the type of tsunami alerts which unfortunately had to be undertaken 
on the, on the 11th of March. And uh, let me explain about the 11th of March this year a catastrophe which occurred uh, next to the Japanese shores. There were, in addition to the big earthquake, 10,000 more aftershocks. Each and every one potentially becoming the next tsunami. If the next tsunami would have hit Fukushima, it would have been more disaster because already the building was uh, uh, disintegrating. Our organization was following uh, each and every, each and every uh, of the, of the 10,000 aftershocks, and we tried to be on, on high alert and try to uh, transfer the data to, to enable authorities to release an alert. Let me show you something interesting. It's our so-called hydroacoustic monitoring. The, the distance between this moving line is the fourth line, the rupture line of the tsunami which happened. And in itself, the length of this line, which was around 800 kilometers, is an indication of a tsunami-generating earthquake. This technology is not being used right now by the tsunami warning authorities. This is a new technology and we are, through training, through education, through capacity development, we are trying to alert them that this is a technology they should use. This is not a, a quick reaction technology, but very important. Uh, here you see how Fukushima power plant release was moving from Japan and was spreading. Fortunately, it was moving to the east, and it was not moving to the west. We have around 90 stations right now. They are small dots on this map, which can detect radionuclide release globally. We are not dependent on any national authority to release or not to release data. We are above the fray of national authorities. We are continuously releasing the measurement about radioactive isotopes, which can be harmful for the population, which can be harmful because of the habitat being affected, food, animals, and so on. So what we were doing during the Fukushima days collecting data with 90 stations around the world, releasing that data as soon as we had it, explaining the significance together with World Health Organization, uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization and, and other organizations, plus providing a forecast where the release might go in the next 72 hours. Three days ahead, we were predicting which countries and which stations can be hit. Petropavlovsk, by the way, was one of the early stations outside Japan which was affected. Okay, so uh, even with the, with the lucky eastward, even with the lucky eastward uh, winds, there was a release. The Information was shared with 120 countries. We have uh, 1,200 institutions. If uh, another 500 would uh, sign up, uh, there will be 1,700. We are not limiting the number. And uh, the information was extremely important because based on this information, from the correlation of different isotopes, we were able to tell authorities that uh, there is a problem with the reactor. It's uh, depicted on this slide as well. An isotope tellurium is appearing at 1,000 degrees and above. There was no acknowledgement by the authorities at that time that there was a problem with the reactor. From this information, it was absolutely clear you cannot fool uh, the laws of physics at 1,000 degrees, tellurium appears, full stop. 
you cannot explain away. Or the proportion of these different isotopes, which is a reminder whether the release is coming from within the reactor or a spent fuel pond. Another reminder here, watch the red dots. The red dots are stations reached by the release from Fukushima. In two weeks, the release went around the world. It's a reminder that if there is, a, there is a, even a limited nuclear conflict, no nuclear release and conflict can be limited because in two weeks' time, it went around, the release went around the world. Okay? No one is sitting behind a wall and no one is sitting in a way that, uh, that he or she or the country can feel insulated. The message from this map is twofold. Number one, we have to make sure that uh, the nuclear weapon stockpiles uh, will be diminishing in numbers and we will eliminate them. And number two, the use of nuclear energy is underpinned, among others, with the type of mitigation systems like the one we are having. I would like to stop here because uh, I, I do not want to push you too far. I don't know what is the time frame, by the way. <laughs> uh, if, you have, uh, if you have questions, please. Большое спасибо, Тибор, за интересный рассказ о том, как происходит мониторинг ядерных взрывов и ядерных несчастий на нашей земле. К счастью, этот мониторинг весьма и весьма эффективный, и все такого рода происшествия или испытания сразу засекаются. И в этом-то состоит роль договора о всеобщем запрещении ядерных испытаний, к которым, конечно, пока присоединились большинство, значительное большинство стран, но некоторые очень важные страны, которые разрабатывают ядерное вооружение, как это становится известно, пока не присоединились, что, конечно, создает угрозу международным отношениям. Я предлагаю вам сесть, чтобы было удобнее. Пожалуйста, какие есть вопросы? Пожалуйста, молодой человек. Good, good afternoon, Honorable Mr. Toa. My name is Anton Moisekin, uh, Faculty of International Relations. Mm, and I would like to ask you if there is any real possibility that the USA will uh, finally ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Thank you. If you ask me based on the present day realities in the Senate of the United States or in the Congress as such. There is no nonpartisan cooperation right now. Not just on this issue, but on any issue, debt ceiling or all the defining issues, there is no consensus reached. For this treaty to be ratified by the United States and uh, to enable the treaty to, to enter into force, 67 votes, positive votes, are needed in the Senate out of 100. It's not realistic at this stage. Uh, the U.S. administration under uh, President Obama is very much engaged in, uh, in trying to reach out to, to the Republican eyes. Under President Bush, I must admit that uh, there was a good support for building out the system. So those dots which I showed you, monitoring system, more than 80% of the U.S. monitor, U.S. territory-based monitoring system was put in place under the years of President Bush. The present administration is, is, is uh, unfolding uh, an effort I call the information educational effort. I don't think in the next uh, 14 months it will lead to ratification. If I turn around the same issue, then, and this is, a, this is a question for all of us, not just with the U.S. ratification, but with other ratifications, China, 
is not easy to, see, to foresee. The ratification of Israel, Iran, Egypt, extremely complicated. The ratification of North Korea is, is even more complicated. How we will bring on board uh, India and Pakistan, how they will sign up, looks impossible. But let me turn around the issue, and, and this was a question I asked this, this morning. In, in, I was in the peer center. If looking upon sig things uh, post-October 1962, when suddenly the world woke up, when, uh, when suddenly political leaders woke up that, oh, uh, <laughs> oops, the, uh, we dropped the ball. All of us dropped the ball. And uh, nearly we managed to, to, to blow up the globe. So in a hindsight, of course, there was a totally different approach to things. Everything seemed suddenly to be doable. In six months, compared to efforts going on, on for, for more than a decade, a test ban treaty, partial test ban treaty was possible. In six months after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. So political reality can mean different things. What I would like to emphasize that we have to do certain things, otherwise we are just believing in the infallibility, in our infallibility, the infallibility of the system, which is, which is to secure your security and, and, and our security. And we might be wrong. I, I'm using two examples. Yes, uh, financial economic experts reminded us for many, many years that uh, the last financial economic me uh, uh, meltdown and, and uh, the last probably in the, in the centuries happened in 1929-1933. And you can see how, how, how far they were right. Or it was repeated again and again, Chernobyl, never. And uh, those people were right again. And uh, if infallibility is the, the only currency we will be basing your future as well, we cannot do that. So we, we will have to find ways and means how to, how to get around what looks impossible to do now. Because in hindsight, it might be the wrong way to look upon things. Спасибо. Пожалуйста, еще есть вопросы? Есть? Не, не вижу. А, пожалуйста, молодой uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Talk. Thank you for a very informative lecture. I'd like you to ask you a question. It's quite connected with the previous one. Let's just imagine the hypothetical situation that the USA has ratified this agreement. How this decision will affect other other countries added you to this agreement, and why it will it will affect it this way? Thank you. Okay, let me let me describe to you a scenario which is at this stage not realistic. I would hope that it could happen uh, in the next uh, two to five years. If the U.S. ratification happens. Um, Chinese leaders repeatedly stated that, um, yes, China is ready to ratify the treaty. And uh, it happened with other treaties as well that uh, China moved very quickly. There is another treaty prohibiting chemical weapons. The ratification of US and, and China will bring up the issue about India and Pakistan. And, uh, India indicated that uh, with uh, especially China among the ratifiers, uh, it wouldn't stand in the way of the treaty entering into force. An Indian ratification would drag Pakistan on because uh, right now, of course, uh, there are many issues where Pakistan is very insistent on staying out of diplomatic uh, arms control efforts but with, uh, with India on board, with all the P5, including China on board, I don't think that, uh, that uh, this resistance can be sustained. Israel uh, is telling uh, 
the community of Wars that uh, it's, it's constructively thinking about the ratification. Good first step, they signed the treaty. They are not among the MPT members, as you might know, non-proliferation treaty. Uh, Egypt and Iran, two other countries from the Middle East region, it might be extremely difficult for Iran to explain away why not to join a treaty which has nothing to do with nuclear energy. This treaty is a, is a clear line, or you are on the military side or you are on the peaceful side. There, there is no uh, thing like I, I am like carrying out nuclear tests for the sake of, of peaceful use of nuclear energy. And countries are choosing on which side they have to be. And, uh, and again, it, 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 it will have to be an oar of truth for, for Iran. And, and hopefully they will choose the right side. North Korea, no one knows. But uh, with, uh, with the P5, including China, undertaking obligations, and DPRK saying, no, 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 I am above you guys. You might, <laughs> you might have undertaken all those obligations, but uh, I am at a higher level than the P5. Uh, the economic and trade realities on the spot would indicate to me that there are leverages. Not, not necessarily tough arm twisting, but there are leverages to convince North Korea uh, about, about joining in. Indonesia is ready to, to ratify soon. What I told you is a, is a, is a there are, um, there is a massive number of ifs, okay? And uh, at this stage, again, I could uh, line up many, many arguments why it could not happen. But the emphasis we should put with, together with you is how it should happen. And let me make a, a final point here, and it's a bit of the commercials, okay? Uh, I would like to convince the Institute to, to join something which we are launching right now. It's an educational course. It's an educational course combining diplomacy and politics related to verification with the monitoring technologies. And I try to give you a taste about the monitoring technologies. The two go hand in hand. You cannot separate one from the other. And right now we have two constituencies, some people sitting in technical universities who are knowledgeable about the technologies, and future diplomats here, sitting here who are very well polished about the politics. We, have, we need a fusion, okay, to use a, a nuclear word. We need a fusion between these two constituencies. In late October, uh, we will launch a three weeks long course which will be accessible through the internet, video streaming, both real-time and archived lectures. Uh, you will have the best lecturers. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a diplomat, I'm a it. I don't know many of the things about technologies. We will line up the best experts on technologies. And uh, the idea would be to, to attract you, your attention, the attention of the, of the institute, and to take part in something which is becoming quite massive. We had 300 registered users for a one-week uh, portion, which we launched in September. We will, we will issue a certificate for that, a certificate which hopefully will be, will be later recognized by a number of educational institutions as well, embedding this program into their normal <coughs> curriculum. So take it as a commercial, this was, <laughs> we are back now, but uh, I would like to really uh, inspire you to, to join in. Why? Because uh, I feel a bit that my heart is a bit here as well, so I wanted to make sure that the connection remains. Спасибо. Это бесплатный курс? Totally free. You might be surprised, but this one is free. <laughs> Это очень важно, на самом деле, это, поскольку э, вообще-то бесплатно э, хуже, чем платно. Потому что когда люди платят, они всегда слушают внимательно, ходят и yes, понимают, что yes, они получают деньги. Так же, как те, кто будут заниматься... На... Free, but not free of value. Let's put it like that. Пожалуйста, еще вопросы по курсу по ядерной безопасности.
Но я, пользуясь своим положением, хотел бы уточнить, у нас вопросы касались США. Обама, когда стал президентом, несколько раз выступал, и очень ярко была речь в Праге, касалась как раз ядерного разоружения и безопасности. И, может быть, даже во многом эта речь определила то, что ему присудили Нобелевскую премию мира, поскольку заявления были очень прогрессивные и долго, долгоиграющие. Вот как вы могли бы, если это вам этично, оценить с тех пор позицию США в отношении ядерного разоружения? There were a couple of ideas put forward by, by the president, and uh, some of those ideas were later embraced by presidents Obama and Medvedev. And later, some of the ideas were embraced by, by other leaders, G8 leaders. The core element of the statement is totally new, moving towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons. And uh, again, realpolitik, so-called realpolitik of the day, might dictate that Locke is totally naive. Forget about that. He himself said, it will not happen in my lifetime. At the same time, he was not the first one who said that we have to move there. What I find more shocking, that a politician like Henry Kissinger, two years before the Obama statement in Prague said, because of the terrorist nexus, nuclear weapons do not represent an asset anymore. It's a liability. And Henry Kissinger is not a, a blue-eyed, uh, naive bureaucrat like myself, okay? He is a, is, he's a hardcore conservative. He's a hardcore realist. So, If he said so, there must be something in the message which, which uh, President Obama put in a more holistic context. In addition to the concept, he was enumerating a couple of practical steps. One of those steps did happen, the uh, cuts in the US-Russian Federation strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, it took some heavy lifting because of the ratification effort in the U.S. Senate. It was not easy. A lot of political capital was deployed, probably as a, as a, as a result of investing in the New Star Treaty. There was less political energy and capital left for another idea, which was to ratify the Tesben Treaty. Uh, the time spent on the, on the start, new start ratification prevented to, to move more forcefully to the, to the CTBT. There was an idea about FMCT, fissile material cutoff. For your information, why it is important, more and more fissile material is still being produced. One example is South Asia. There is, a, there is an open-ended arms race. It's not good to have more fissile material in more places handled by more people. I don't have to connect the dots. Why? Because of the terrorism. Negotiations still to start. The administration is investing. Of course, it takes not one to tango. In this case, uh, Pakistan is the last country from uh, the more than 40 members of the Conference of Design in Geneva to agree to these negotiations to start. Nuclear security. Uh, the president uh, uh, spoke out for removing uh, nuclear fissile materials, which, which might be creating complicated situation uh, from countries, and to uh, get rid of the so-called orphan uh, nuclear material uh, stockpiles. The Non-proliferation treaty and preserving the, the integrity of, of a treaty, which is the building pillar for, for everything we are doing in this area, is, is another underlying element. We can, be, we can be impatient and saying, okay, already uh, two years and uh, six months elapsed. So where are all these elements? Point number one, unfortunately, It takes sometimes as much time to build on these arsenals as it took 
for the build-up. And the build-up happened since 1942 onwards. And uh, the build-on is not happening, unfortunately, in, in two years. I myself spent uh, probably more time than I would have wished with some of the negotiations. It's not a 50 yards dash. It's not something which you can deliver. But again, the message is we need perseverance because otherwise, in the absence, again, of tools, softer tools like diplomacy, like uh, agreements, like verification, like transparency, no one of you and of us will be better off. It will be an extremely tough future. So that's why we will have to work on, on, on putting in place this agenda. And it might happen that some of you in, in 20 years' time still will be working on, on some of those elements. Still, it will be a good investment. And I would applaud those who will be doing that. Спасибо. Пожалуйста, есть еще вопросы? Ну, я думаю, что сегодня лекция была очень интересная, насыщенная. Она была сложная, может быть, для восприятия. Я имею в виду, что это новый материал, особенно в том, что касается мониторинга. Но это тема, которая действительно не уйдет еще много десятилетий, поскольку ядерное оружие представляет угрозу и технологии его производства могут совершенствоваться, и именно вопрос о запрещении всеобъемлющим испытаний ядерного оружия может остановить его распространение. Я еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, что наш сегодняшний гость – выпускник МГИМО, и вы сегодня были свидетелями, какое образование дает МГИМО в конечном итоге, но еще не в конечном итоге, но, во всяком случае, вы видите профессионала высочайшего уровня, который говорит на двух иностранных языках, на русском, на английском, может быть, еще какие-то знают даже и является специалистом высочайшего класса в области ядерного разоружения и нераспространения ядерного оружия. Поверьте, что мы гордимся нашими выпускниками, и среди вас будут тоже выдающиеся люди, послы, как говорил мой предыдущий декан, у которого я учился, но если вы не сможете стать послами, то, во всяком случае, станете женой посла. Так что у вас в любом случае ожидает хорошая карьера, лишь бы вы хорошо учились и получали здесь максимальные знания. Я очень призываю вас подключаться к тем курсам, которые вам предлагаются, в частности, вот интернет-курс, который предложил Тибор Тот. Понятно, что не все вы захотите заниматься ядерной тематикой, но к те из вас которые тяготеют к этому, к те, кто тяготеет к проблематике международного права и международной безопасности, поверьте, что то, что будет преподаваться вам через интернет, это другой уровень преподавания, в том смысле, что это преподавание в западном стиле, на иностранном языке, и те сертификаты, которые вы можете получить в таких курсах, и в частности, тот курс, который предлагал Тибр Тот, это... Важная, важная строка в вашем резюме и в вашей карьере. И чем больше у вас будет таких сертификатов, тем успешнее вы будете в жизни. Прошу, Дэн. Последнее слово. Не теряйте диплом. <звы> диплом ГИМО – это вечный сертификат. Это сертификат в жизни. И действительно, его нужно беречь, им нужно гордиться. Но мы не знали, что на самом деле, что Тибор где-то затерял свой диплом. И все равно подготовились к сегодняшнему его визиту. И мне доставляет большую честь наградить за подписью ректора МГИМО Академии Анатолия Васильевича Таркунова, наградить Тибора Тота почетным, знаком почетного члена Ассоциации выпускников МГИМО чем, в принципе, подтверждается его <смех> учеба в МГИМО и, соответственно, наличие диплома. Ну, конечно, мы выдадим дубликат. Вот очень красивый знак. Я с удовольствием вручу его нашему
я надеюсь, на, на лекциях сидеть не надо будет. Спасибо. Спасибо всем.